minute. One minute, you're up half a million in soybeans, and the next, boom, your kids don't go to college and they've repossessed your Bentley. Are you with me? The revolution starts now. Starts now. We have to pass the bill so that you can uh, find out what is in it. Turn those machines back on! You are about to enter the Peter Schiff Show. Show me the money! If we lose freedom here, there's no place to escape to. This is the last stand on Earth. The Peter Schiff Show is on. Call in now. 855-4-SHIFT. That's 855-472-4433. I don't know when they decided that they wanted to make a virtue out of selfishness. Your money. Your stories. Your freedom. The Peter Schiff Show. Welcome back, everyone. This is Neeraj Chaudhry. I'm a founding member of the Los Angeles branch of Europe Pacific Capital, sitting in for Peter Schiff today. I love that quote uh, from Trading Places. Turn those machines back on. Turn those machines back on. That's uh, from a movie called Trading Places, uh, one of my all-time favorites, and just a, a real fun, fun movie. One of the producers of that movie was a gentleman by the name of Aaron Russo, uh, Aaron Russo unfortunately passed away a few years ago, but he was a uh, he was an interesting man. I didn't agree with everything that he uh, espoused, but he's a very interesting man, and um, he uh, put together a movie uh, called America: Freedom uh, to Fascism, and it was a terrific, terrific uh, movie. Very again, don't necessarily agree with everything that's in that movie, but a really solid introduction to uh, to some key subjects, and uh, you know that movie was not extremely popular, although it was very well thought out and uh and uh it was definitely a passion project for uh for Aaron Russo who uh who died I think just about a year after that uh, after that movie came out. Um but uh you know the question is when you have those kinds of uh of pieces of uh, something like a, a film or if you have something like uh an idea that we want to spread you know, what is the best way to do that? How can we best uh, share the ideas of liberty? Movies are great. People love movies. Millions of people go to movies every week. They are the dominant cultural form uh, in America, and maybe that's one idea. But at, at a day-to-day level amongst our family and friends and in our communities and in our workplaces, how can we best spread the ideas of liberty? How can we really uh, take uh, advantage of this seismic shift of these changing times when so much could be at risk in our uh, in our country, and how can we kind of steer our country back uh, towards a positive path? How can we get things moving again, and how can we share the idea with people that uh, the source of our greatness is really our freedom and the liberties that uh, that maybe we've been taking for granted, but we can always reclaim because we we have the voice. And towards that end, I've asked uh, Judd Weiss, who is a friend to the liberty movement. Uh, an entrepreneur and blogger, uh, to join us today. Uh, Judd has uh, been been thinking about this issue for for several years, and he has uh, been speaking about it at various conferences um, uh, around the country. As far as how can we spread the ideas of liberty? Movies are great, um, but on a day to day basis, amongst uh, people that we know, how can we how can we best share these ideas in a way that that really resonates with people? Um, you know, as as uh, you may have reflected in your own lives and in your amongst your own circle of friends and family, uh, many people call themselves fiscally conservative. Many people call themselves socially liberal, and yet the branding, the idea of someone being a libertarian, uh, for some people, uh, makes people think of uh, you know survivalists in the middle of the of nowhere. Um, but that does not necessarily. Uh, have to be the case. Really, there are, there are a lot of people every day that you know in your own life who espouse these ideals and yet um, do not necessarily identify as liber, as libertarians. Uh, Judd, are you on the line with us? I'm here. Not near it. Thank you. Sure, sure. Welcome to the show, and uh, and thanks for uh, waking up early on a Friday morning. Uh, yeah, thanks you've been, for having me, buddy. Sure thing, sure thing. You've been, uh, you've been contemplating this issue for a while, and I've known you. I know you've, uh, you've spoken about it on several occasions. Uh, what uh, what ideas come to mind when you think about uh, how can we uh, share these ideas and how can we best spread them? Uh, cat pictures. I think a lot of cat pictures is a good solution. What do you cat think? pictures. I agree with you. <laughs> well, the, the introduction you just gave me is a pretty big undertaking. You know, how are we going to shift the whole country back to liberty? Uh, well, that's well, why, that's why I called you. Talk- not, oh, yeah, I'd love to do that <laughs> t- today or tomorrow. But 
uh, basically what I've been doing is going back to the fundamentals of sales and, and just looking at, at uh, this as a sales pitch and how are we going to sell this idea. And, and I look back to the fundamentals of sales, and fundamentally as a salesman, you're just offering value. And, and perhaps uh, long intellectual lectures aren't valuable to a lot of people. They're just not connecting with it. And I think we need to look at more options and, and, and really think through what we're doing. Because I think we've got a great product. We're selling, you know, dignity and your right to live your life as you see fit and prosperity and peace. We, we've got a lot of things we're offering. I just think we have a horrible sales method. So the way I like to quickly explain it is, you know, let's say you've got a car you want to sell to somebody. Imagine how it would impact the sale if at the same time you try to explicitly convince your buyer that he's an idiot. Because <laughs> that's what we're doing in a lot of ways. So we've, we've got a great product. We've got a really bad sales method, if we have a sales method at all. And, and so I, I like us to, to rethink that. Well, when you, when you say that we have a bad sales method, I mean, uh, you know, salesmen always have kind of a bad reputation. Oh, you're just trying to sell me something. Uh, what do you mean by a bad sales method? If I if I'm uh, with a friend and maybe he's a liberal, and we're talking about uh, say Social Security or Medicare or whatever, when you say a bad sales method, what what do you mean by that? Or when you say we try to convince people they're idiots or try to tell them we're idiots, what what do you mean by that? Well, well, we're kind of in our, our own world, and and the way I like to think about things is uh, the way I like to explain this is that. In a company, there's, we're, we're capitalists, we believe in a division of labor, and in company, there's generally uh, a good reason why the inventors and the engineers are not necessarily the salesmen. Because if you could imagine what would happen if you fired all the salesmen at a car company and said, you know, screw those slimy guys, these engineers know the product much better, let's just fire all the salesmen and have the engineers sell direct on the showroom floor, what you'd have is the liberty movement. Because that's basically what we are. We've got a lot <laughs> of very intelligent guys uh, who who really hashed out the details and, and thought through these ideas and developed a very solid, well-engineered product. But what we don't have are people that are able to sell this very well. And the difference is an engineer has got to eat, breathe, and sleep his product. He's got to digest it and know it, really focus on it fully. A salesman has to understand the product deeply as well. The difference is that the focus needs to be people, understanding people, connecting with people, and, and, and finding out where they're at and meeting them there and helping to, to, to persuade them and show them the value of what they're selling. That's interesting. That's interesting. So you're saying that the, the people who come up with uh, sort of the, the philosophy, the libertarian uh, philosophy, might not be the, the best people to, uh, to share it uh, with others. Uh, I'm curious. We're going to head into a little bit of a break here. And when we come back, I'm very interested to know, uh, what uh, methodologies then would you use to to share these ideas? And even if we don't like to call it sales, uh, we're sharing these ideals with people, and we're sharing something that we believe in, in our hearts and in our souls. We live, breathe, and, and eat liberty. And so the question is, how can we best uh, share these ideas? When we come back from our break, we're going to get into that a little bit more, and I want to thank uh, Judd Weiss for joining us, and we'll talk to you in a bit. Show. You've heard of Karl Marx, right? Well, now, meet his worst nightmare. This is the Peter Schiff Show. Karl Marx's worst nightmare. Well, Peter Schiff, I know you, and I think you are Karl Marx's worst nightmare. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a, it's a good, uh, good moniker for you. This is Neeraj Chaudhry. I'm uh, sitting in for Peter Schiff today, and joining uh, me with uh, joining with me now is Judd Weiss, and we're talking about how to best spread the ideas of liberty. How can we, uh, amongst our friends and family and people in the community, maybe people at work, um, people that we that we care about and ideals that we care about so much, how can we best share these things in a way that um, that resonates with people? Because most people uh, that we know. Uh, seem to espouse these ideals 
uh, of liberty, and yet uh, libertarians, identified libertarians, um, uh, seem to be something like ten, less than 10% of the population, maybe just a few percentage points, and yet the ideas themselves are actually very popular. Uh, Judd, uh, you were going to uh, tell us a little bit more about sort of uh, the sales method and how, how we can best uh, approach people and share these ideas with them in a way that resonates. Yeah, sure. Well, you know me. I, I did pretty well in my um, background in selling commercial real estate. I sold apartment buildings, maybe $2 million, $5 million, uh, you know, up to $9, $10 million, stuff like that. But we, I'd have to understand the scope of what I'm selling, and we got to understand the scope of what we're what we're trying to do here. Uh, you can sell, let's say, a five dollar item to a million people, or you can sell a five million dollar item to one person. Uh, it's a it's a very different thing. If you're selling five dollar item, you know it doesn't have to be a major benefit. It doesn't have to be very comfortable experience. I mean, look at uh, you know Black Friday and what people would do to get their stuff. It didn't have to be very simple to purchase it. But if you're selling a five million dollar item, and it's got to be a serious benefit for the person, probably for their family, for their business partners, for their future. Uh, it's not a comfortable thing moving $5 million out of your bank account. So you've got to make it as comfortable as humanly possible if you're going to sell that thing, if you're a salesman. And it's never a simple process uh, on uh, a, a sale that, of that scope. But you as a salesman want to do everything in your power to make it as simple as humanly possible. So what are we selling? Well, we're trying to get people to change their fundamental view of everything and not to trust the schools, media, and politicians, but to trust us instead. So no big deal. You know, that's not that big of a sale, right? Not and at we've all. Got, what, we've got 300 million people in this country. We need about 150 million to get a majority, at least 75 million to get a voting majority. So, you know, that's not a lot of sales there, right? It's no big deal. Easy. We should so, have it done by noon. Right. So I don't think we're, we're paying attention to the scope of what we're trying to do. Uh, uh, changing someone's fundamental view of everything is a lot harder than getting trying to sell a five million dollar property. This is a big sale, and and it and we're certainly not going to do it if we're not conscientious of how we're approaching it. And if we're attacking people, if you're attacking people and you're attacking customers, you're not qualified to sell shoes or furniture or retail cosmetics, let alone apartment buildings or cars or anything. So uh, right now. We're very self-righteous and fairly nasty in our approach. and well, I think it's because people really believe in their hearts and souls that these ideas are true and right. And uh, I think they're feeling maybe a little uh, picked on or maybe a little defensive because um, these ideas are not often espoused, uh, as you said, in some of our, our social and political and, and uh, media institutions. Absolutely, and that's totally understandable. But that's the difference between an engineer and a salesman. An engineer just has to be right, <laughs> but a salesman has to be effective. Their goals are different. That's uh, interesting. Hopefully a salesman is basing, is selling something that was engineered correctly. I mean, we're going to hope for that so that he's not selling junk. But he's got to learn how to be effective. And what I'm trying to get across here is there's more to selling something than just exposing people's inaccuracies and errors. It, we, we actually have to actually sell. So... Uh, the, you know, every negotiation in business has a dispute about terms. Usually that term is price, but there's a whole slew of terms that people disagree on. But you don't have to go to war on every single business deal. There is a way to deal with each other with differences and do it cooperatively. And and that's what I see is missing. Because I remember when, when I was young in, 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 um, in, biz, in the business world, and I was just starting out, I was really bad. Things I would do and say, would, if I look back on it now, I would cringe. And that's kind of how I feel about most of the people that are uh, activists right now, because there's a lot of activity. There's a lot of activism because there's activity, but it's not effective. And to me, it's like watching firemen armed with hoses filled with gasoline. It's like they're, they're making the job harder for themselves. Um, so when, you, when you're selling something, you want to make sure that it's attractive, uh, that it's comfortable and non-threatening, and also that it's simple. And attractive is obvious because you want to you, you want people to be excited if you if, if if you want them to move. Non-threatening should be pretty obvious because you know nobody can tolerate a threat. If you've got a murderer in your house, you got to get rid of him. If someone's going to try to attack you and everything that you believe in and and and, and you as a person, you're going to have to shut him down. And simple is pretty obvious because. 
you know, if it's too complicated, you're, you're, the, the more complicated it is, the bigger the hurdle for people to come over. And if it's too complicated, then you've got a wall and people just can't come over. So I'm saying that our job as salesmen is to be more attract, make the product we're selling more attractive, more comfortable and non-threatening, and also a lot simpler. But I think we're failing in attractive, we're failing in, in non-threatening, and we're failing in simple. But if you're fail in attractive or, or the simple area, you're not... Uh, you're just ineffective as a salesman. But if you're failing in the non-threatening department, you're not ineffective. You're actually backwards. You're actually doing harm. You're actually causing people to wall up really fast and, and turn away from you. And I see that as our problem. Because uh, if you think about it, you know, soldiers are known as the defenders of liberty, and they're given parades and a hero's welcome. Why aren't liberty activists? We're, we are the defenders of liberty. We're liberty activists. Why aren't we giving the heroes welcome? Why are we actually actively hated by a lot of people and, and, and opposed? And I think a lot of it has to do with us. It's our own fault. Our approach is bad. We're scaring people away, and we're upsetting people. Sounds, and, like, and it's, sounds like some tough love. I mean, in a way, uh, when you, when you uh, say something like that, my first reaction is, hey, wait a minute. I, I believe in this stuff. I'm passionate about it. I care about liberty. What do you, you, know, what do you mean I've got the wrong approach? But... It sounds like maybe that might be the, the exact problem is that we're letting our passions get in the way and we have to kind of set those aside for a minute and just focus on some of these ideas about how best to communicate about being attractive and being uh, – or, or making ideas attractive and non-threatening and simple. Is that, is that kind of what you're, what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, and I'm all for passion. I don't want people to lose that. What I want them to do is change how they're approaching people. Mm, so the, okay. the fundamental idea is that ideas – are not people, and people are not ideas. You now hold views that you didn't before and might not in the future. And just because some, like, let's say a toddler might not understand things, we don't disavow him as some ignorant jerk. We help him learn and understand. And if somebody's misguided and doesn't understand something correctly, uh, it's not appropriate to disavow him as a person. It, it's, it's a much better approach to try to help him learn and understand. Uh, the, the issue... The, the discussion of the ideas and, and the, the issues and the discussion of someone's character are totally separate discussions, but we mix them all the time. We say, like, that guy's some liberal idiot or conservative jerk. You know, those, we're, we're combining the, the, the discussion of the ideas and the discussion of the character, and that's completely inappropriate, but it's widespread. And it makes sense because that's, everybody's in their safe space, and among the choir there's, there's no harm in that because you're not pissing off the choir. But you are completely uh, shutting off your ability to connect with somebody who doesn't agree with you if you if you just uh, um, if you if you mix those two if you attack their character because of their ideas and it's completely inappropriate to do it. You Judd, we've got this, sorry, we've got just oh, about a minute left. I don't mean to uh, to cut you off there, but if you sure. can give us a couple of uh, techniques or tactics that uh, may work for us, uh, I'm sure everyone would be very interested to hear about that. Uh, sure. Am I coming back after the break or no? Uh, we'll see if we can get you back on, but um, if you've okay. got just a minute. Uh, I think that the major problem that we're doing is, uh, is waking people up is, is, is our worst approach that we're, we're doing right now. You, um, you have to understand, you know, it makes sense because you want people to see, but waking people up, if, if I could sell things by just waking people up, it would be fantastic, but that's not a sales approach because waking people up is perceptual. Selling something is conceptual. It, it, you actually have to deal with, persuade them, deal with their, their mind and think about it. You just wake people up by honking horns okay. and, and banging pants. And I think All right, Judd, we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to bring you back um, in just a couple of, a few, little bit here. We now return to the Peter Schiff Show. Call in now, 855-4-SHIFT. That's 855-472-4433. Radio, the Peter Schiff Show. Welcome back, everyone. My name is Neeraj Chaudhry. I'm an investment consultant and founding member of the Los Angeles branch of Euro Pacific Capital, and I'm uh, sitting in for uh, Peter Schiff today. And joining us uh, back from the break now is Judd Weiss. He's uh, giving us some ideas about uh, how we can best sort of share the ideas of liberty with people and sort of drawing a distinction between having the best ideas, which I think everyone agrees that we do, uh, and yet being more effective with communicating those ideas, which he is describing sort of as a separate process. Uh, Judd, um, 
tell us a little bit more about uh, how you see things. A little bit of tough love, but I think uh, we're all very interested. Well, yeah, you can give tough love because, after all, it is love. It is love. And I love all of these guys. I'm, I'm trying to do the best I can to help. But what I want people to think about is how do you shoot down the ideas while lifting people up? Because right now people get upset that somebody disagrees with them and they shoot down the person. And I, I think that that's a huge m- mistake. Because how the hell are we going to sell this message of respect and tolerance when we're disrespectful and intolerant when we do it. Great point. So um, you have to understand that people need to save face, and you can't, um, you can't take them down and, and expect them to be receptive to you. Ideas don't flow among opponents. They flow among allies. So our major shift needs to be that we need to treat people like potential allies. We need to be understanding of the fact that that they might not agree, that that, that that doesn't mean that they're unintelligent or that they're a jerk, that they actually just want, if they're an activist and they, they, they're, they're diametrically opposed, that they actually just want a better world. We actually have the same goal. They just have a different approach, and, and, and you've got to treat them that way. Um, it's normal for people to split up and, and to cause all this infighting and, and, and stuff like that. I mean, look how many ways the church split up. People have differences of opinion, and they generally take it personally. This is normal human behavior. I'm just saying that it's not effective. And I was talking a little bit earlier about the the concept of waking people up and why it's so disastrous. It's that that when you're selling something, that's, that's conceptual, meaning you have to deal with their understanding. You have to actually convince somebody. If you're waking somebody up, that's perceptual. It's like just banging pots and pans or honking your horn. It's like, move, you know, you're, you're blocking traffic, you honk at them. That's waking somebody up. Uh, if we're trying to do that as a, our sales method, uh, we have no hope. There's just no way we can move forward. And that's basically the way I see our sales method is we're trying to just wake people up in, into changing their fundamental view of everything. You actually have to sell them on it. You have to convince them. You have to help them understand. It's a very different method. And and that's... that's um, that's one of the major things that I see is, a, is our problem. Well, what's the, well tell me, what's a, give me an example of an issue where there's a difference between waking them up and convincing them. Let's just say maybe uh, inflation, the Federal Reserve. Many, many people that, uh, that I talk to every day are not necessarily aware of uh, exactly what the Federal Reserve is, what they do. I'm talking about outside the liberty movement. Uh, what the Federal Reserve is, what they do, what is inflation, uh, why is it bad, how does it hurt people – uh, that's a case where, um, you know, I may need to wake someone up or I may feel like I want to wake someone up. But at the same time, uh, if they really understood what the Federal Reserve was and, and why it's detrimental to their pocketbook, I think a lot of people would be very upset by by the fact that um, they're able to sort of steal purchasing power. So let's let's take that maybe as an example and tell me how how would you uh, approach uh, someone sort of waking someone up or making them understand what the Federal Reserve is? Well, sure, you've got to teach them, and you want to help them understand. I mean, I, I, I'm not saying I'm, – I'm basically saying if, if somebody disagrees with you, you your, your, your goal isn't to just wake them up. Your goal is to actually help them understand and learn. And so I, I carry around $100 trillion Zimbabwe note in my wallet. It's, like, it's a good talking point, and I show them, you know, this is worth about, I don't know, 250 I think you can get them for like 5 bucks on eBay now. Yep. It, 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 it'll buy a nice hamburger. And – and, and you can explain things in a way of, look, this is what happens when governments are responsible and they run huge debts and, 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 uh, and everybody's on the hook for this stuff. And if we don't pay it back in taxes, they're going to have to print it and everything that, you know, and all the harms there. And I don't want to go into the whole argument there. But, no, no. But basically you want to just show them that, look, you know, I'm on your side. I want to help you. I want you to explain, to understand this, but you want to keep this as simple as humanly possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, you want to show that printing money doesn't actually create resources for society. It just shifts them because it creates dollars that other people use for those resources. Or, um, you know, if we have a dollar crisis, what does that mean? I mean, you just explain really quickly that it means that gas goes, you know, to $40 a gallon or $400 a gallon, and only very wealthy people can travel at all. You just, you just want to make it really concrete what, that, what that's going to actually mean. So in a and sense, so that's we are, how you make things very simple. So in a sense, we are 
waking them up, but we're doing it in a way that is very relatable and in a way that they can really understand the impact in their own lives. Right, right. You know, basically, the, the, if there's nothing else anybody remembers from what I have to say today, what, the point that I really want to get across is say whatever you like, say it as strongly as you like. Just try to come from a friendlier place. There's no reason our criticism can't be constructive. What about something that, uh, that that's uh, maybe a little bit more emotional and something that uh, a lot more people are aware of, uh, something like uh, the gun issue? Uh, on the one hand, uh, when we when we see these kinds of tragedies uh, take place, the school shooting um, a few weeks ago, a couple of months ago, uh, mm-hmm. you know, your heart goes out to the the children and the families of the children who are who are being affected, who have the children have, who've died. And the families who who now have to somehow find a way to to continue with their lives that's sort of the one side of it and the other side of it is um you know the fact that we do have certain rights in the constitution and they weren't just placed there by happenstance there was a great deal of thought that went into that uh how do you uh, what, how would you approach something like that yeah i mean it's a it, it that's a tough one because people are so emotionally charged you've got to calm them down you got to let them know look I, I don't want people to die kids to die in school this is not something that happens very often it's a very rare occurrence i don't know if we have a solution to prevent uh crazy people from causing problems what i do know is as a going owner myself i'm a very peaceful person and i don't feel it's right to come in and uh s- send armed armed men with guns to take away guns from other people uh, 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 millions of peaceful people. I just think that that's wrong. So if you get, you can get that across that you, you just want to make it clear. I mean, I'm, we're getting into concrete now when I was just uh, being more abstract in, in our earlier talk, what I was saying earlier, but you, you want to make it clear that I don't want this to happen, but I just don't think that the solution is to go and forcibly uh, violate the rights of millions of peaceful people who have hurt nobody and who are law-abiding. That's interesting. So what it sounds like maybe what you're saying is that it's not so much what we say, maybe sometimes it's how we say it, sort of the tone, the, as you, I think you said earlier, sort of the, the self-righteousness, which comes out of, out of a, a place of passion and, uh, and caring and sincere and strong belief in these, in these beautiful ideas, uh, but sometimes may come across uh, as self-righteous and uh, may impede our ability to communicate. Is that is that sort of the heart of what you're yeah, of what sure. you're talking about? Yeah, there's no problem with passion, and everybody does it. I mean, it's done on all sides. I'm just saying we're not being very effective if that's going to be our approach. And 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 frankly, we're, I think we're doing pretty well in the intellectual arena. The liberty movement is just rocketing, getting uh, getting you know inroads in, in in intellectual thought, but. Uh, what we're, we're still failing out is the social arena. And I think sometimes our goal is not to convince people intellectually. We've got to, like, just make us seem a lot cooler. So that's what I do in my personal world. I mean, you've noticed I throw a lot of these events and parties. I have libertarian speakers. I take a lot of photos of libertarians. I'm trying to make these nerds look a little bit cooler in my small way. And so uh, I, th- there's a lot more to it. I'm... Um, uh, when I was saying earlier, we need to be attractive, you know, non-threatening and simple. Uh, my talk that I've been giving at eight different libertarian conferences this last year is about the non-threatening issue. But we also have to make things a lot more attractive, and we also have to make uh, make this a lot simpler too. And so th- those are totally separate discussions, but mm-hmm. uh, very important pieces of the puzzle as well. How would you uh, deal with someone who, on the other side of the issue, maybe is a bit self-righteous and says? You know, uh, I think I was uh, reading the other day that um, Mayor Bloomberg had a uh, had a conference about gun control and how can we control guns better, uh, and it was saying something. I think it was Tony Bennett who came out and said, uh, you know, uh, we we have to set the tone for uh, behavior for the world, and we have to uh, so therefore we have to get all the guns out so that we you know we we set this. Uh, this example for the rest of the world. That's probably the exact opposite of what uh, most of our listeners and, and uh, certainly myself believe that there's sure. that there's a way to have responsible gun owners. Um, what would be so? How if you if you're dealing with someone on the other side who's self righteous, what is what is your best uh, advice as to how to kind of uh, deal with someone who's like that? Well, sometimes you just might not be able to convince somebody intellectually. They're, de- they're determined. They're, they're, they're stuck. They're stubborn. You're just not going to get through. But the, at least 
you can not do things to make you hate, make them hate you more, and at the very least, and uh, and and not do things to inflame them unnecessarily and start more of a war. Uh, so, uh, because there, if you do that, you're just going to make them more impassioned, more stubborn, and uh, you know you, you're not going to be doing yourself any favors there. So that, that, at the very least, you can also make the intellectual argument, and and if you if you get them to calm down and and be a little bit friendlier towards you. You you might be able to get through and make make that intellectual argument, but uh, first, very first, you've got to we've got to stop uh, upsetting everybody. We got to stop turning people off in a big way, and and uh, treating people as enemies. There is no other uh, outcome but to turn people off in a big way. Fair enough, fair enough. Well, thank you very much, Judd. I really appreciate uh, you taking the time to uh, to join us today. I think that, um, again, a lot of tough love, but you've certainly given us something to, uh, to consider and think about. Uh, many of us feel very passionate about, the, about these ideas, and, uh, and that's a good thing. But uh, when communicating these ideas, maybe if we, if we set aside a little bit of that passion and just focus on certain techniques of communication, uh, that may help us um, uh, in, uh, in sharing these ideas and spreading these, these ideas a little bit better. And give us that opportunity uh, to reclaim the country. Yes, it's a well, big agenda. Really glad to be on, Nerd. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely, it's a big agenda. You're absolutely right. It's a it's a huge, huge uh, scope. But uh, I think we're up to the challenge. And if we're not, God help us. Uh, but we're up to the challenge. Let's do this thing, and we'll be back right after the break. Mm-hmm. 